Good morning, guys, with Worsley in the shop. We thought it'd be a great time to do a Q&A this week. It's been 11 months, we just checked, <laughs> since our last one. And uh, you guys have flooded us with all kinds of amazing questions. And the funny thing about doing a Q&A, we're trying to answer your questions, but your questions cause us to think and come up with all of a sudden ideas that we never thought of. So thank you, and thanks for your comments. And um, some of you just left a nice comment and didn't have a question, but uh, we appreciate that. And for all of you who have been commenting on our videos, we read, we're able to read every single comment, but sometimes we get a little behind on liking them or answering back. But never think you're just talking to nobody because we see them all and we appreciate them all, so thank you. Probably the easiest way to do it is to answer the questions separately and then we'll try to mix them together. Uh, you also may hear a boat from time to time in the background because uh, there's 17, I think, uh, young guys, dance age up here, cousins and friends, and they're ripping around on sea dudes and boats and having a wonderful time. So uh, let's get right into it. What I've done is uh, put all the questions into categories. I think there's 160 questions. And I put them into categories like uh, vehicle questions, things about, you know, what's your next vehicle and uh, what are you doing with the Jeep? And then travel plans is another category and, and so on. That way we can answer any duplicates at, at once rather than jumping all over the place. So we're going to start with uh, questions about vehicles. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, love every episode. You have a great family. Thank you. I'm curious about your next adventure vehicle and if it'll be a truck, jeep, or adventure van. All right, well, we're getting right into it. Um, here, here's the situation, and this may answer, I'll flip through the other questions, but this may answer a lot of them all in one. Um, some of the questions were in regards to the replacement of the engine. Are you going to um, find a replacement? Can you get a better price? And so on. Some of you said, uh, reach out to your buddy, Sean from Story Till Now and some of those guys and see if they can help you. Well, here's what happened. We, I actually did. I had text Sean uh, and told him what happened with the engine. And uh, he said, call me in five minutes. So I called him in five minutes and he had already reached out to Paul at Epic uh, Adventure Outfitters. They're a shop that do modifications on Jeeps. They do really good work. They do all of Sean's stuff and KC 250s. Um, and so Sean had already called him and asked him if there was an engine available, if he knew of anything. And he had called White Rock Dodge Jeep, which is the dealership that they work with. And sure enough, they were able to source uh, used, uh, actually it's a new engine. Someone, I think it had like 10 kilometers on it. Uh, someone had done a swap. And so that new engine was sitting there and uh, they put it, a hold on it for me right away. Um, I was going to, either we were going to tow the Jeep out there and get it installed or ship the motor here and get it installed if I could get a decent price. I was able to negotiate with the shop here and get a decent price, very competitive price for install. And um, the good people at White Rock, our friend Patrick, um, was able to find a company to ship it. So the, there's an engine halfway here from BC, somewhere in the prairies, probably crossing uh, Canada and should be here towards the end of next week. And so that's really good news for us. We were able to get a really good price at least a quarter or, or even less of uh, what we had been quoted originally. So um, we're very happy about that. And so f within, so I, I assume next week, most of the time the engine is shipping. When it arrives, they're going to start installing. That'll take another seven, five days or something with proper testing. And then we should have Worsley back in full operation. So that's definitely the cheapest, quickest way for us to get back on the road and to continue our journey. And so we're happy that uh, everything came together and thank you to uh, Sean for making all that happen so quick and to Paul at Epic and uh, Pat Patrick at uh, White Rock Dodge. Everyone came through for us and it was so nice and to hear all the comments from all of you. Thank you for your concern and for all your help. Like I, it was a little overwhelming, um, all the help that we were receiving and just ideas and um, you know, people just, yeah, just it was really, really heartwarming. Um, but yes, Sean and Epic Adventures and White Rock uh, out in BC blew our 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 uh, minds with the care and the effort you put into getting us that new engine and getting it shipped over here so fast. I I literally was in tears when uh, White Rock called us and told us that it was being shipped. It was awesome. So you guys are just thumbs up all the way. Um, can't thank you enough. 
and we'll be back on the road very soon. So that for us is a good news story, but it's not the end of the story. We are still on the lookout for our next uh, adventure vehicle that is more purpose built for long trips. And we'll talk about uh, plans for long trips coming up very soon. So um, this question said, would you consider a truck, Jeep or adventure van? And we have been looking at all the above. Uh, the beauty about this, what we're thinking, we're going to, be able to keep both Jeeps. So a lot of you are Jeep fans and said, man, I would hate for you to get rid of the Jeeps, especially with all the history you have with them. And we that got us thinking. We thought, you know what, they're, they're both paid off. There's no reason for us to sell them. And the kids are going to be wanting a vehicle of their own very soon. And they all love Jeeps. So one of the vehicles uh, the boys could use as the adventure guys and uh, on Dan Van Stralen channel. And if you haven't followed Dan, go check it out. He's got his own YouTube that he just started. He's, I think, publishing his third video this weekend, uh, plus some older ones. But check him out. He would love uh, if you follow along on his uh, adventure. But um, we think uh, one of the Jeeps would go to the boys. <clears throat> and then when Carol, Caroline is done with her uh, year of service, she's going to be needing a vehicle. And she loves um, the Jeeps and has so much history with them that uh, we'll be able to transfer both those vehicles to the kids and keep them in the family, which is awesome. So if we, Carol and I, want to go on a Jeep adventure in the mountains, um, we still can do that, no matter what vehicle we end up in. But we're looking at uh, options. We talked about a van last week, and um, and then we spoke with some of our friends, uh, and, and in particular, friends of ours that have lived in a van for many years, and uh, asked them for their advice. I learned years ago the difference between opinion and advice. You ask someone who uh, has never lived in a van about what it's like, they'll give you their opinion. Uh, it's too cramped or it's awesome, but they've never really done it for years on end, so they are just giving their opinion. But someone who's lived in a van for many, many years, and then they give you some uh, their opinion, that's what I would call advice because they know they've been there, they've done it, they've, got, they've seen all the good times, and they've, they'll share with you the struggles. And I asked them if they would ever look at another vehicle and they said, yeah, after all these years, what we find is just space constraints in a van. It's, it's very agile, it can go all kinds of places. But if you're, you know, if you're going out for a week and then saying, wow, I, I, I made it through this week of camping, it was amazing, can't wait to get home and stretch my legs and so on. That's one thing, a van will do you. And some people go for many, many years in a van, but for us with, um, need office need for office space and just after our seven years of traveling we've also been in uh, larger spaces like the RV and, and smaller spaces like the Jeep so we also have the same feeling I I've always loved the space we have in the in the motorhome but I hate the fact that it's two-wheel drive and we can't go off-road so we're looking now more at a you know a truck option over adventure van that option seems to give a four-wheel drive capable vehicle with um, a camper on the back or a box on the back you know built in that gives you when you're set up at camp gives you a, a taste of that luxury and space that you get in an RV so um, like I said we we haven't made up our decision we're just doing our research but that's where we're leaning now after doing a week of watching many many videos and talking to a lot of people and we have some really cool things that have come out of the woodwork because we put this out last week and and it's amazing we have the best uh, audience on youtube in the world and everyone's so caring and so helpful we've just been flooded with help and with ideas and with opportunities so we will share more with you as it becomes uh more concrete um but yeah lots of exciting things happening in the vehicle department have you thought about a diesel engine for worsley um it would be good fuel mileage and longevity of the motor. We haven't looked into it too much, but that definitely would be a good option at some point. But right now, because we have a, a new engine going in, we're in good shape. Do you think there's another vehicle out there that could fill the shoes of the Jeep? No, a Jeep is a Jeep. You, you, when you're crawling on trails in the mountains, it's very hard to beat a Jeep. Even a Toyota truck will struggle. Um, a Bronco might be able to keep up. I don't know, I've never driven one, but uh, Jeeps are special, but they're very purpose-built, and our Jeeps are purpose-built because we were our traveling in the last couple of years was focused mostly on North America, mostly on 
remote mountain trails and things like that, the Jeeps are perfect for that. And and that's why I'm happy we're keeping them because uh, at some point we'll be going back to that. But our uh, when we talk about our travel plans, you'll see why we need the kind of vehicle that we're, we're planning to build. I don't know if you can um, compete with Jeeps. Like Jeeps are just meant for trail. Um, but I do think that we can kind of take a little bit from the Jeep, take a little bit of what we know moving forward, how we're going to be traveling. Um, now we kind of have like a real clear vision of the style of overland we, we want to do and the travel we want to do. Um, like the trails are super fun. They're, they're really cool. And I'm so thankful that we got to do them um, all together when the kids were, you know, young and preteen. And now that they're young adults, they kind of like want to broaden that to um, like world travel. And um, so, yeah, what would be the perfect one? Like I now my focus is more like, yes, good suspension, but can it be legal in all the different countries? Like from the tire sizes to the bumpers um, to the lights on the outside, because some of them, you know, you they have to be covered. You know, you can't have those big lights, or some you can't have stubby bumpers. They have to be full. And then most countries, 35 inch is the um, the max that you can go for your tire. So you're not going to be coming, you know, with 40 tires and you know uh, all that kind of stuff. So and then fuel, like you know, diesel isn't. And I mean, yes, it's in a lot of places, but not, you know, very good quality in, in some, and it'd be harder to find. So we're kind of like weighing all of that moving forward um, into what would be the perfect build. And then also, can we have a, a spot that, you know, now that the kids are advancing their technology with cameras and and just everything, I don't even know what half the gadgets are um, that they use, but is there a spot that could be safe, that they can be constantly charging and on, you know ready to go, and a place that they can sit and edit out of the elements, like um, if they're working on different projects together or you know, whatever it may be. A Jeep, it works, but it wouldn't work for all of us being in the Jeep, trying to all cram in there and um, do what we need to do, especially now that, you know, they're all starting to really um, start on their own careers to, uh, um, as well. So that's a big part in our decision moving forward um, is just space like that. And for me, it would be like, so the boys want to go with their adventure bikes, but if we want, to, I want to make it where we are in camps less and more out and on the road more. Um, so that means like, can I do laundry? So like, do I have, you know, that, that, because they're going to be sweating through all their clothes and, you know, their riding gear and how to make them comfortable that they can sometimes after a couple of days meet up with us, offload all their gear and, you know, we can get things washed, cleaned up, and then they can also offload and do still, you know, still send off all their work things that they are doing and working on and, uh, editing and all that stuff. Yes, I'm still talking about the kids, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's kind of where, what I'm thinking when it comes to that build and, and probably um, food storage. Like I, I like to have bigger fridge. I know like with Worsley not having a fridge in it anymore um, because it's in the trailer, which we don't have at the time. this time, it does make it a little inconvenient if you're doing long trips, having a cooler. So um, yeah, we're just kind of looking at all those options. And I kind of want to have a vehicle that you can have a pass through. So instead of climbing down the ladder and then into your um, vehicle, whatever we decide, I, I would like to have it where you can go in and out. And Dan Grek actually from the road shows me, he just built out his Jeep and that is just an awesome design. Um, I thought that was really neat. And we've been looking at other ones, like what you guys have been mentioning about the gladiator with an alu cab or a truck with an alu cab. And I also like the 5010, I believe it is. And team hunt has one on their, um, gladiator that that is hands down my favorite gladiator build, like hands down. Um, you guys should check out that video. It just has everything like from storage to tables to, you know, water to like their platform is just so thought out and well done. 
um, definitely my favorite one. I mean, he even put a spot for her to put her purse in, like, and then their kid, they um, hunt, it sits in the back, and he has all his toy spot and everything. Like, it is just so well thought out. Anyways, um, yeah, so that's, it's a lot to think about, but probably on the top of my list is um, a, a big enough table that we could probably all work at, or, you know, at least, like, come together and work on projects, and if it had it passed through as well. Um, that's probably top. It probably won't happen because <laughs> I mean, I, but then again, like I said, Dan Greck with the road chose me, he made it possible. And so, I mean, that's when light bulbs went off for Pete and I, um, you guys check out his, um, rig too. I think it's at the expo right now. So pretty cool. Someone said, how is Vandy still standing after 300,000 miles with all that weight? Uh, it, she has 300,000 kilometers plus about a hundred thousand kilometers of tow. Uh, travel towing behind the RV back in the early days. So yeah, um, it's probably 300,000 miles um, How's she still going? Well, it They told us at the dealership those tw 2012 and 2013 in that range was a really good engine and um, So partially because the engine was awesome, but also we even though we do crazy adventures we don't we drive the vehicle with the idea of um, longevity in mind. We want it to last. We're not going out for a weekend and hammering it and go, oh, well, we broke something, no big deal, take it to the shop. When you're living in your vehicle, you don't have that luxury, you don't have that option. If you break something on the trail or have a breakdown of some sort and you're in a foreign country or far away from home, you don't know the area, you don't know the shops, you're gonna be down for a long period of time. And we've had that happen from, you know, from, thankfully very, quite rarely, but um, you're into big expenses, into staying in a hotel or something nearby while the repair is happening. So we drive with uh, what Clay Croft calls the expedition mindset, thinking of completing the expedition rather than uh, you know just getting through the day. So I hope that answers your question. What are your three top future overland picks if you were to get a new vehicle? Please say Jeep Gladiator. Um, the, the Jeep Gladiator is an awesome uh, platform to build and there's so many options now. And a lot of you have suggested Jeep Gladiator with an aloe cap. And uh, friends of ours are down in on the Pan Am right now in a Jeep Gladiator aloe cab uh, configuration, and they love it. It's it's uh, definitely a solid option. But we're still looking. So, like I said earlier, we're we're leaning towards away from the van option and towards uh, some kind of a truck option. So that's in the in the running for sure. Wouldn't a new engine be cheaper than having to buy an outfit, a new vehicle, when your Jeep only needs an engine? Yes, you're right. And that got us really thinking about that option, and that's what we're doing right now. What are your thoughts on Earth Roamer, LTI, or SX? I think you should stick with the Jeep or get a Gladiator with the Alicap, so the Canopy Camper. So the Earth Roamers are amazing. We've only seen, we've never used them. We've seen them at uh, different expos, but right now they're out of our price range. Even used ones are pretty steep, but man, if you can afford them, they're great trucks. Uh, do you have any thoughts on Toyotas, perhaps a 4Runner, Sequoia, the legendary reliability and lifespan of the Toyota? Um, definitely something to consider. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the kids, we haven't spent any time or very little time in Toyotas, but uh, the kids have with uh, X Overland and they love them. And I've heard so much about their legendary reliability. And uh, so those are the things uh, we're looking at as well. Um, we don't have anything concrete yet, but yeah, we love the Toyota idea. How many miles on Worsley now? Funny thing is, I don't know because uh, the cluster, which is the display that reads that, um, went out probably almost a year ago. And I just haven't uh, pulled the trigger on the $1,000 plus repair job, but maybe we'll get that done while they're doing the engine. This question says, would you wait for the Land Cruiser if it's coming to the U.S. in 2024 to replace Vandy or the white Jeep? Um, that would be amazing if those uh, Land Cruisers are coming in. I guess they, they've got to the age now where you can import them by 2024. But we, uh, we need to keep rolling so we wouldn't wait for that. But uh, that's a vehicle we'd want to check out when it gets here. It's why Jeeps and not different rigs. Um, our first vehicle was Carol's everyday driver. She owned a Jeep. Before that, she had a Dodge truck, but she's always liked the idea of getting off-road and when uh, she was driving by the dealership and they were offloading uh, an Arctic edition, which um, there's, they've only made like 
under 2,000 of them in the world. And it was a really neat look. The color, that's Vandy, the blue, blue silver, blue Jeep. And uh, she thought, man, that's the Jeep I want. And we were able to make that happen, trade in her Dodge truck and everything. So then we thought we might as well stick with the platform and we bought another Jeep and we love them. Then. And they've been the perfect vehicles for our travels to date. Would you ever consider going back to the RV Jeep dual hybrid overlanding? If yes or no, why? Um, you know what? Uh, we were just thinking about that. And if we didn't get the engine redone so fast, um, we were actually thinking of doing this trip to Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. Um, with the RV towing or um, towing Vandy again, like going right back to day one of our adventures. Um, so that's uh, interesting that you asked that. So yes, it was. It, that's the first thing that popped into our minds because then that way we could um, leave it parked somewhere. Plus, I was going to pick up all of our gear that's scattered all over the country right now, um, and we could also you know, Pete could edit, we could have a place to, you know, clean up and, um, but we would have parked it and then done our trip, come back and then cross the country in it because it's just so easy to cross the country in um, a vehicle like the RV. Like when you're in a Jeep with big tires and it, it just sucks a lot of gas, there's a lot of wear and tear on your vehicle. Those Jeeps are made to be off-road, not traveling down highways, especially the whole country and we've done it so many times that sometimes it's uh it we consider actually shipping them over and then flying in and picking them up um just it, it's it's fine if you have a destination or you know you're you know it's part of your trip it's great but if you're just hauling and you're not stopping it's just full blast um it's a bit much after like eight or ten times so um that's that's an awesome combination you know that the rv is on a, a sprinter mercedes sprinter with a comfortable winnebago back with lots of room for two people plenty of room you can walk around like it's a cabin and then you can quite easily tow the jeep um the only reason we and if we had no other option we'd go back to that because we have both vehicles but there's some limitations to that for sure and the reason we not we don't want to choose that what we've talked about quite a quite a few years now is I wish we could take the RV and the Jeep and mash them together and get the best of both worlds. And we think we have a solution um, in mind and we'll definitely share that with you as we get closer. Have you considered a V8 swap for Worsley? Oh, I'm sure the boys have. Like, I hear Pete talking and he's like all over that. Um, is it um, moving forward with our plans traveling internationally? Is it a smart decision? I don't know. Um, I probably wouldn't do that, but We'll see what the boys do. I know they are wanting to kind of take over um, Worsley and build it out and, and continue uh, traveling in that. And Caroline, I mean, she was like, oh, Vandy. She's all, always like had a, a Vandy as her favorite. And uh, so I'll see what she wants to do with Vandy. But um, yeah, that's something you guys will have to ask the boys when... Uh, they start driving it more. Someone has a 2013 Rubicon and they're considering going on a trip and saying, is it too risky to travel or should I wait to get a new one? I don't know, uh, uh, Worsley, or sorry, Vandy is a 2012 and we've been all over and it's been such a good, reliable machine for us. I wouldn't hesitate, especially if you're staying within the US, um, there's, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Just drive it with that expedition mindset. All right, that's it for uh, vehicle questions. I skipped through some because they were uh, duplicates, but hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're thinking and what we're doing in the short time, and we'll be able to share more about our long-term vehicle. That would be just for Carol and I uh, in the future. How do you find traveling with a dog with feeding and storage of dog food? Um, Traveling with a dog, it's a little bit harder when you're in national parks because a lot of them don't allow dogs in there or, you know, they have to be constantly on a leash. Um, sometimes, like if you say you want to go to Banff and things like that, it is um, difficult because, you know, especially for Lando, he doesn't really care for being on a leash. He'll tolerate it. But then after a while, he wants to go running. And um, so it all depends on your dog breed. Um, if that would make it more of a struggle or not. 
Um, for Lando, we kind of steer clear of that. And sometimes I, it's a little bit like, ah, because I really wanted to go in and maybe take my time at a, at a restaurant or visiting with friends, but maybe, you know, their children are afraid of dogs, even though Lando just loves everybody. But it's just, you know, it's, um, you got to kind of think of that. And um, when we're traveling, I put his dog food actually in an old ammo crate that I bought. Um, I just found that, that the, you know, um, squirrels can't get into it. Animals have a really hard time trying to open that. Actually none have. Um, and it has a handle on it. It works great. Um, yeah. So, and feeding, yeah, it's, he eats, um, basically whatever we're eating on top of his food. Um, and the breeders, when they gave him to us, uh, he was eating imes out of all things. I know a lot of people might not agree with that, but we have stuck with, with that um, dog food brand since then, and we haven't really changed it up for him. But he does eat normally, like I said, everything that we're eating. And like if in the morning, I, you know, he'll eat some eggs and some bacon grease on top of his or if we're yeah just basically everything and when it comes to blueberries he's he loves blueberries it's um kind of funny but yes overlanding with a dog what are the must-haves what are your tips to finding dog friendly areas on i overlander uh i know peter has been talking about that app too it will say like it'll have a little paw print so you know that's a good area for dogs or sometimes it's crossed out or not there and then you you know okay that's not a good you know maybe safe spot or um, what have you, but uh, must-haves is a good medical kit. Also like maybe his favorite uh, blanket or pillow, um, something that makes his little area cozy because he's going to be, or your dog is going to be experiencing tons of change from, you know, areas from like the desert, maybe he's not used to that, to mountains, to, you know, fast flowing rivers, to lakes, tons of other people or tons of other um, animal scents um uh, other animal uh droppings and things like that so he he or she will be super kind of confused sometimes and um so th just having a little something of theirs so that when they go to bed it just it's just like having a, a young a young child you know sometimes when you're traveling and experiencing so much that's a, like almost a sort of brain overload um that just that one little piece their favorite you know, blanket or pillow. But yeah, medical supply, definitely. And you know your dog or, you know, your cat um, and what it kind of needs. Lando sometimes maybe with an ear infection when he was a young pup, he hasn't had that since. But I, I just keep all of that um, in his little bag and it normally sits on the headrest um, right there so that we can get to it. My question is regarding Lando, how do you handle vet emergencies while out on the trail? Do you have an emergency kit for him? And if so, what are some of the items? I did mention some of them in the last question, but yeah, we have found, um, we have needed a vet once and it was an emergency with Lando. Um, he needed stitches and we needed to be rush him right in and uh, they took him in, no problem. So I keep all his medical records um, right behind the driver's seat um, so that way it makes it really easy when a situation like that happens or if one of the kids happen to have him and something happens they know where the records are too so the whole family knows where his records are and where his medical kit is and I'd probably add to that he does have some type of Advil for dog um, so if he's in a great deal of pain and say we're out on the trail and it's going to take us a couple hours um, to get to the vet. Uh, that would be probably a great idea to have. Something for his upset stomach, if he's vomiting or um, having diarrhea. He has not had that, but they do have supplements like that. So I would just maybe sit down with your veterinarian and say, this is what we're doing. We're going on this trip. And sometimes um, they'll, they'll just make a whole kit with you like uh, and personalize it for your dog's needs. Lando luckily has been really easy uh, thus far. All right, I'm gonna move into uh, travel plans. That seems like the natural next uh, category to, to talk about. He's asking if uh, we are gonna be at an expo so we can shake hands one day. Um, man, we sure hope so. We've really missed uh, not being at the last two and seeing all of you, but uh, hopefully if things work out, we'll be able to be at the, the Mountain Expo in, in Colorado. But for sure, um, 
we're going to try to get to more in the future as long as we're here on the continent. Do you intend to have a cabin as your long-term home base? Do you feel you're going to continue your travels without the kids or focus on lake life? That's a great question. So yes, um, as you know, we've spent quite a bit of time here at the cabin, got off the road for a while and uh, focus on the infrastructure needed to have this as our home base. We're very happy to say that we now feel comfortable coming here in summer, spring, fall or winter and we have the infrastructure in place. We have the solar working and some of you have asked about solar. Uh, that's working amazing. Ever since the panels went in we haven't had to run the generator at all. So we're very happy with that and um, we've we can come in the winter. Yes, it's it's nice to have this place uh, to come home to if we, for some reason, need to or just want to. So now that we have this all established, we want to get back on the road. So your question was, are you going to continue to travel or just focus on lake life? No, we we have a lot of world yet to see. We're really adventurers at heart, and we've had this dream for many years now to drive around the world, and there's a lot of world out there still to drive around. So um, we're going to carry on as soon as we can, as soon as Vandy's back, Carol and I are hitting the road. What's your favorite place to visit in Canada and why? Thanks for sharing your adventures. So I could speak for myself. I know if I asked the kids and Carol, they'd all have their own probably. Um, Dan always likes the Maritimes and, and Newfoundland in particular. That, that kind of uh, place is his vibe. Um, for me, it would be, be northern British Columbia, Canada. Um, I just love it because of the epic scenery, the mountains, the wildlife and just how remote and wild that place still is. And just you can just get off on trails and cross rivers and head into the mountains and not see another soul for many, many days, if at all, during your entire trip. So uh, Northern BC, I love it. What are your plans for this winter? Another winter at the cabin or heading south? So that, this might be a perfect time to talk about what Carol and I have in mind. Now, if you watch one of our videos in the winter, we are doing a lot of planning um, for the next three to five years of where we hope to go and uh, what overland adventures we want to take. We had mentioned the Pan American, Europe with North Africa, and then South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, where Pete is right now with the XO team. Um, so those in the short term and then in the long term after that we want to go back to Australia. We've only done part of Australia but we'd love to do the big loop and and then who knows from that. Um, so we had to make a decision and what makes most sense for us is to do the Pan Am right starting now. So here's how we think it'll go. So Carol and I will do the journey from Prudhoe Bay down to mainland US. The boys don't need to do that section because they did it last year with uh, X Overland. And then we'll try to meet up with the boys at that point. Dan's gonna be busy here at the island, building his channel and doing all the projects he's working on in his cabin. Pete is in Africa filming with X Overland. Caroline is gonna be going to Europe. So it makes sense for Carol and I to do an empty nest uh, edition, which uh, one of the questions or several, several of the questions were, when are you going to do your next empty nest? So that's coming up real soon. As soon as we get Worsley back, we're going to begin that leg of the journey. The next uh, part of the journey, which is through Baja into uh, Central America and then into South America, we're going to do with the boys. And right now it looks like they want to do it on their adventure bikes. So that'll answer that question as well. Are there any more adventures ahead with the uh, the adventure guys and their bikes? And so, yeah, it looks like there will be. That's going to be an epic, unbelievable uh, adventure, and we can't wait to uh, get that one started and to bring all kinds of uh, all the adventures to you on YouTube and on Patreon.com. Um, they dream about them. They talk about them. They're constantly, yeah, like, yeah, they are definitely going to be. Um, riding their bikes again and that's going to be a big trip for them a lot of miles on the saddle so that i am really excited for that whole adventure for the boys have you ever spent time in the outer banks of north carolina believe it or not we haven't we've driven by there on our way south uh several times but we've heard so many amazing things seen videos and pictures of that place and for sure we if we ever find ourselves heading down the east coast we're going to spend some time out there it looks beautiful where haven't you been that you'd really like to go? I answered that a bit earlier, but um, the, the next three to five years, all of those plans, the entire Pan Am, Europe, North Africa, South Africa, Australia, and on. Would you consider a visit to Morocco with the Sahara, the oceans and the mountains? Yes, uh, for sure. We'd love to do Europe in two stages. Um, 
like the northern part of Europe, including Scandinavia and all that. And then the second part would be more southern and Spain and then cross into Morocco and get into the Sahara. That'd be amazing. I remember you saying your travels are a way of life, not a vacation or holidays. Um, do you ever feel like you need a trip away from the Jeeps or the cabin? Just turn off the cameras and enjoy yourself and be a typical tourist. So I don't know if uh, being a typical tourist, you know, I'd be taking pictures and probably filming anyway. So uh, it yes, it's a, a way of life versus a vacation. But man, sometimes it feels like a good mix of both. What ratio of time spent at the cabin versus the road do you see in the next 12 months? It's probably going to be more like 80, 20, 80 on the road, 20 back at the cabin because um, we have some big trips planned. When are you guys coming to Australia? We'd love to give you a warm welcome to our shores. Oh man, I don't know the exact date, but it's definitely on our list and we can't wait to do the big lap. We have uh, friends and family in Adelaide, so we were able to go there years ago when we were in Australia or in New Zealand. We, we popped over to Australia and drove the Great Ocean Road and just loved it. So. Uh, thanks for the invitation and it's on our list. Do you have any plans to come to Europe? We would be great to see you somewhere driving in the Netherlands or Austria. And the answer is yes. And my family comes from the Netherlands. My parents immigrated to Canada when they were very, very young and they met over here, but their family's all there. So definitely we can't wait. Is there a certain area you want to go back to and explore more of? What is it and why? Um, we. We're focusing mostly on going places we have never been yet over the next couple of years, but to go back to would be Australia. That's one that we just got a, a basic feel for, but uh, it's a massive continent and uh, we've seen, you know, our friend Dan Grek just got back from there. And so it's, it's a rugged, especially in the north and the west, uh, you know, empty, rugged beaches and just lots to see. So yeah, that's, that'd probably be the place. This question from DV Offroad. Um, we met you in Moab. That was a lot of fun. And thanks for watching our show all the time. When are you coming back to Texas again so we can barbecue on the beach? That sounds awful good. Who knows? We might be there sooner than you think. TF Adventure, thanks for your question. When do you plan to travel back to the U.S.? And have you ever considered a meetup with your fans? Um, so you've heard our short-term and long-term plans, but some of that does uh, bring us into the U.S. And so... Have we considered a meetup? Yes. We don't know right now how to organize that, but probably expos are the best place to do that. So um, we'll definitely, definitely let everyone know because we can't wait to see all you guys. Here's a question about the Trans Canada Adventure Trail. Have you considered doing it? And yes, we have. We've started looking into that. We've crossed Canada many times, but someone has put together a route of you know country roads and trails all the way across Canada. So. That'd be a lot of fun and we'll probably we'll have to do that at some point but um we've got a lot on our plate right now so that wraps up the uh, travel questions hopefully all your questions were answered with that i'm going to move on to the next category which has to do with youtube and cameras and things like that so pete's jeep adventures what's your go-to camera when filming your adventures um that's an awesome question and it's definitely changed over the years um we if you think of the trip Carol and I did up to the Arctic, we had a, a Sony A7R4, which is mostly a stills camera, but it also does great video. And we used that for some shots. And then we also did a lot of GoPro. So we had a GoPro 10, I believe. And the, the nice thing about the GoPro, we could hang it out the window as we're driving and it takes care of everything. It levels the horizon. It does the right exposure for the light we're in. It'll adjust automatically. Um, the coloring is always perfect. Um, it's just not as high res as what we use now, so we don't end up using GoPros as much as we used to. But if you're just starting out, um, GoPro does an uh, amazing job. Nowadays we use it for certain things where we need a, a camera that, you know, it's in a dangerous spot. We don't want to drop one of our very expensive cameras, or we use it for underwater. But that was always the go-to um, camera for us. But now, especially with Pete uh, learning so much about cinematography, he wants to have all of our edits to be more cinematic. And so here's the camera list we have now. What we're filming this on right now is called an FX6 by Sony. It's a, it's a cinema camera, so it's definitely not a run and gun camera. And we use that for things like this, tripod work. Pete does um, action shots with it and in camp and so on. It's just gonna be a really high quality picture that comes out of that. But for more of the vlog style stuff we have with a Sony, ZVE1. 
and that's a smaller camera but it's also a cinema, cinema camera so between those two we can capture pretty much everything so I hope that answers your question what did you both do for work before you started adventure living so we had a business um, and I'll put a link to a video that explains it in more detail but my brothers and I started a business when we were really young and over the years we grew that business eventually got into franchise and Carol was busy with a, a major career as a mom <laughs> raising kids and um, that's a, that's a crazy job right there but then when the kids all three were in school back in the day she would co come in she would come into our office and just work with me and do all kinds of things whatever needed to be done but she was really the heart of the office and everybody loved it when she showed up as did I and she made it uh, more of a fun place to be than just a, a boring office so we worked together but I was a, a franchisor so our business was a, a lawn mowing business believe it or not and then we started opening franchises all over Canada and then I helped to negotiate a deal with a, a large group uh, in Texas and together we built up to 200 franchises in Canada and the US and then um, that large company in Texas which is called the Neighborly Group of Companies ended up buying our brand which is the Grounds Guys and I became a shareholder there and that allowed me to have the, the free time to be able to go and start a new business uh, with content creation and travel and do adventure living. Minus the filming, once you have it all together and start editing, how many hours does it take? And second part of that is, do you pay for your music? So I'll answer the easy one, the music. Yeah, we use artlist.io and it's a subscription based and there's all kinds of music there. And once you download it, it is royalty free. So back in the early days, our videos were getting demonetized all the time because we weren't, we didn't know enough to use royalty free music. And then um, we basically created the videos with no um, monetization. So artlist.io. The first part about editing. Um, so it used to take less time back in the day when we were just uh, using simpler cameras and so on. But now uh, it's probably 10 to 12 hours easy on editing because we do a lot in post-production. Um, we're filming in raw and then we have to color and, you know, correct, color correct and all those things. And you end up with a much better picture. In fact, a lot of you have commented that, that wow, the videos have improved. And we think it's worth the time and effort because we're creating a long lasting video that we can look back on and it's not all pixelated. You know, if we're gonna capture memories, might as well capture them really well. And not only that, but it's Pete's and the kids, they've developed a passion for the cinematography. So they're filming in movie or Netflix, Netflix quality and putting it on YouTube. But the beauty of that is we have all that footage which could be repurposed uh, for very, for all kinds of different things. So to answer that question quickly, it's about 10 to 12 hours. Hey guys, I'm always wondering who's behind the camera filming the most. Well, that, that as well has morphed over the years. Caroline used to be our, the main person doing the filming um, and Carol. Carol captures, you know, crazy moments because she has, she always had a small vlog camera in her pocket. She could pull it out and just film. Um, and Caroline would get all the epic stuff from the B-roll and the mountains and the beautiful shots and all that stuff. So, um, but over the last couple of years, she's been handing off that and, and teaching everyone and, and Pete and Dan and Caroline also were able to spend time with Clay Croft at X Overland and learn a lot of cinematography and film skills. He's a, a filmmaker and has shared so much information and training with them. They did an apprenticeship at, at sort of at the beginning and they've been able to um, all develop those skills themselves. So in the last year or so, the, the lead camera person would definitely be Pete. You know, once we're full-time empty nesters and the kids are married and moved on, are we gonna still create content? Um, I would say yes, we've learned to, we've grown to love it. We still wanna capture those memories and we've met all of you because of the YouTube channel. So it's got a life of its own. It's gone beyond just creating content. It's now become this huge family that we um, feel we're all a part of. So I would hate to just walk away from it all. So I would say the answer is we'll, we definitely keep creating content. As long as you guys will watch it, we'll create it. What technology and apps do you use on your adventures? That's a great question. Uh, we use Gaia GPS a lot for trails in the backcountry. Um, we use iOverlander, which is amazing when you're crossing places, countries or places you've never been. 
um, you'll find camp spots which other people have used and they'll they'll rate them and so on that that's a very heavily used uh, app by us um, other apps like I mean just the general maps uh, Apple Maps things like that for road running it always finds the fastest way all the normal office stuff like uh, I have like a turbo scan because if I got to scan documents and sign them or date them or you know mark them up and I'm on the road and I can't get the laptop I can do some of that stuff on the phone um, those are very handy um, I have an app called Expensify so I just take picture of all our receipts and then you can run a report of what you're spending that's a handy one for budgeting and uh, things like that and then um, Zolio the Zolio app for off-grid communications is really handy and then there's a couple apps for technology within the vehicle Wabasto has an app for turning on off the heater and then um, I also have a Red Arc app, which allows me to see how the batteries are doing and the whole state of the ele electrical within the vehicle. So hopefully that answers your question. Do you watch other YouTube channels for inspiration or information? Are you planning another winter at the cabin? So there's two parts to this. The first part is, yeah, when we have Wi-Fi like here at the cabin, we definitely watch uh, other YouTube channels. Some of them are other overlanders, especially ones that we've gone out with, um, like uh, Trail Recon and Marco, uh, uh, Overland X or Lifestyle Overland, our friends there, uh, Sean, KC250. We always check in on our Overland family. We don't have tons of time to to watch, but you know, every once in a while we'll do that. We also, you said for uh, information, yeah, we do, um, especially in our vehicle, our search for vehicles. If we can't get to an expo, we go to YouTube and we watch dozens and dozens of uh, videos on trucks and vans and jeeps and different campers and all that and it's a great way to get lots of information so yep answer is yes do you guys think youtube will be your forever source of income it seems like youtube has taken over entertainment since hollywood has become more and more disconnected from the general public yeah that's a great question um youtube has grown what we like about it and it's not just the youtube platform but streaming video is that you're in control of the programming if you are interested in the subject you can just go right to that subject whereas tv in hollywood it's kind of force fed upon you we haven't had an actual tv with tv programming in at least 12 or 14 years um so it's just been us seeking out the information or the entertainment that we want and being able to to watch it so your first part was uh Will that be your forever source of income? Um, I'm not sure. We, we have, YouTube is a source of income, and also I do public speaking, and um, I may increase that depending on where we are later, but it is uh, wonderful that YouTube does at least provide some income because you put a lot of effort in and buy a lot of expensive equipment to create the videos. That being said, there's all kinds of other avenues for content. So we do we do share um, on Patreon, we share our videos as well, ad free. With your young adults getting older, will they begin their own journey with the YouTube channel? Um, yeah, I think so. Dan already is. Uh, Pete has interest in carrying on with the Adventure Guys channel, which they started when we were uh, in Colorado a couple of years ago. It was focused mainly on uh, adventure bikes and since they've been away from them for some time, they kind of just focused on uh, Epic Family Road Trip. But he wants to resurrect that and and film his version of whatever adventure he's on. So, um, and then Caroline, she's very busy at the moment, but yeah, hopefully she will. She has a lot to share. She's an incredibly talented, um, videographer and people love her voice I, I told her you know you could film nature and do voiceovers and uh, you create these beautiful films if you wanted to so hopefully she will pick it up at some point too when she's back from her year of service will you guys be doing a trip with other youtubers like trail recon or marco etc i love your channel uh thanks for the question joel um oh yeah if we're ever anywhere in the neighborhood of any of the other youtubers uh we we always try to get together and uh, for sure, if we're going to be going south, if Marco and Brad and Regina are in the neighborhood, um, I'm sure we'd do a trail together. It's always so much fun, and we always learn so much from each other. As parents, how are you guys feeling about the kids growing up and taking their way? Caroline on her mission, Peter in Africa, Dan making his solo adventure. I know that they will continue to travel with you, but now that it's just the two of you again, how are you handling that? Um, obviously, it's... Uh different and as you guys saw on our last trip 
um, the first few days were, it wasn't hard, it was just a change and you really kind of, there was an absence, you know, um, with Caroline not being there and it just, you know, you just kind of missed, I missed her, I missed her help um, with her creativity, like with meals or just how she could just set up and, you know, do dishes or do whatever it was like so well. Um, she was kind of like a machine when we got into camp and everything just happened so fast. And the boys are a little bit more laid back, you know, they're like, yeah, I'll get to it. Um, but, uh, now, you know, I'm sure this, this trip, I'm kind of glad I have a few weeks, you know, with the Jeep getting fixed to kind of, um, let things sink in a little bit you know dan is staying back and he's working on his youtube and working on his project pete being in africa and with caroline going to europe soon so it will probably be pretty cool um because you just know that they are on the right path you know if if i was concerned about them or i was worried about them um i don't have that um I know their values and their hearts and they they have a very strong work ethic and they know exactly the direction that they want to go. So that that side of it, I don't have any worries, but I will obviously miss them because I mean, we have become so close. And even before we started traveling, we were a very tight knit family. I mean, we did everything together. Um, so yeah, it's just, it will be, It'll be different, but I'm really looking forward to spending one-on-one -on -one time with Peter again um, and just having that time to like really focus on, you know, just holding hands and um, just having some romantic uh, dinners maybe and setting up camp and maybe lighting some candles. And before that, you know, you can't really do that type of stuff or it's a little bit more awkward. So definitely um looking forward to that because this is a journey that we have really wanted to do um it's been a huge dream of mine and i was super happy that you know pete and the boys and um possibly caroline really wanted to do the same thing so yeah it's going to be special um and i hope we can check off a lot of our little bucket list together so that's an awesome question and i've touched on it a bit in, in our talks but the reality is um, we are very excited about the new chapter. We always see life in chapters and there was a chapter of us raising the kids to young adults and that chapter is over. They are now young adults and they're making their way in the world, finding what their passions are, finding ways that they can make uh, an income while doing something they love. And so we're really excited about it. And when we go on our empty nest uh, trips, we have a blast too. So. Um, yes, we, we miss them being with us, but we also have so much fun. So it's an exciting new chapter and it's a, a, a healthy and normal and good transition for a family. And for a lot of uh, young families that are watching our channel over the years, they had the same questions, I think, that we had knowing, you know, we always said at the beginning, we only have five or six years together with the kids. So let's make the best of it. But we never knew what that would end up like what would the transition be would one get married and leave home would they go you know go on a mission and leave home for that reason and or find their own way we didn't know what it would be but the way it's turning out uh, has been very exciting for us we're super proud of caroline and what she's up to um we're proud of pete over there in africa he's he's doing what he loves and he he'll be back in a couple of months um, and, and hopefully continue doing what he loves with his own channel, as well as being, like you said, I know they're going to continue to travel with you. We're going to keep going on these adventures and any or all of the kids can come with us. Um, but the beauty will be, we'll be mostly filming as empty nesters, our version of the travels, and they'll each individually be filming their own experiences of what they're doing. And if the, mo the boys are there on the bikes, they're not going to be, you know, in front of our vehicle or behind with us. They're going to be uh, probably many, many miles ahead, sometimes camping on their own, experiencing things they're interested in, but we'll always come together and um, share our experiences. So uh, lots of new and exciting things ahead, uh, but to just wrap up the answer, yeah, we're very, very um, proud of the kids and very excited about the new chapter. Uh, here's a parenting question. Hey folks, in your journeys as a family, what were your initial impressions and expectations about parenting on the road? 
and how were you able to navigate the various phases kids go through? What, in your observations, has been the most unexpected and surprising? Anything you'd change? Much love. Wow, there's a lot in there. Um, our initial impressions and expectations of parenting on the road. Um, I don't know if we had any expectations. We didn't know, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know. So we just thought we're going on this epic adventure. Let's try to keep as much normalcy as possible. Um, back then we would do, it, at work we'd do a huddle in the mornings and we'd kind of do that, a version of that as a family. And that was just a time to get up in the morning and um, reconnect as a family and reconnect with our values and kind of have a focus of what we're doing that day and and on we go. We thought that would help keep structure and um, we'd do that in the motorhome or at the beach or whatever and the kids were busy with uh, homeschool and so we what we found out about traveling parenting while on the road is it's actually even you're in close quarters so everything is kind of you have to deal with things right now you can't you know back in our old life it was um, maybe an issue we had to deal with as parents but we, you know I'd say I, I got to get to work and Carol said I, I got to get to the gym and the kids were I got to go to school and, and then they'd get home well my friends are coming over or I'm going here or there and often things you know you're so busy or you're so distracted by things in normal life that you don't have time to deal with it so it gets put on the back burner or not dealt with at all until it festers to the point where it you know blows up as a problem so one of the best things about parenting while on the road you have the, the luxury and the opportunity to parent and to deal with things and to communicate and to have long discuss discussions around a campfire um, and that's uh, a lot of what kids need right I mean I'm not a parenting expert by any means and I haven't read lots of parenting books but <laughs> all I know is what we ran into while we were doing it and I think the luxury of being able to have those long conversations when the kids needed them when they wanted them and not be distracted by all kinds of outside influences was the very best part of the whole thing how are you able to navigate the various phases kids go through yeah that really ties into what I was just saying about having the luxury of lots of time to uh, spend with the kids and, and counsel them and hear them and have them share what they're thinking and so that helps to reduce the amount of phases that a kid goes through or at least shorten the, the time period. They maybe heard something from a friend or saw something or saw something on a movie or whatever that kind of made them get a certain idea. But with all that time as a parent to be able to spend with them, you can become their career counselor or um, help, you know, ask them certain questions so they think deeper about the subject. And that helps to... We always wanted them to come up with their own ideas and to choose their own path, and we've always had it that way, but not without having a good foundation, asking the right questions, and having making your decisions based on all the available information out there. So um, we wanted our kids to be critical thinkers, and uh, they are, and they were raised that way. And sometimes it's annoying as a parent because uh, we taught them to question everything, and so when they get older and they question everything you say, um, we need to not be surprised because we raised them that way and it's actually a good thing. Do the kids have any thoughts of attending college? That's the first part of this question and the answer is no, they haven't shown any interest in pursuing like a scholastic uh, career. They're very entrepreneurial and because they've lived kind of wild and free for the last seven years they can envision themselves being in any kind of a school setting. Uh, the world is their school and they're constantly learning and they do online courses and they're perpetual learners, but um, the college structure just doesn't appeal to them. I also would like to hear about your early life, how you met, got married, etc. So, so thankful for your channel. So thanks for that question. And there's other questions in the exact same vein. So I got to remember back 25 years. Um, in fact, this October, Carol and I will have been married 25 years. Um, and they've been the, uh, just the best years of my life. Um, how did we meet? Well, my family and Carol's family have known each other for many, many years. In fact, they're part of the same church, but just different fellowships, I guess you'd call it. On We're here on the East Coast, and they're way out on the West Coast in uh, Oregon. But every once in a while, we'd get together for conferences, and that's how we met. Um, I was uh, very busy at the time, you know, with our business, building our business. We very rarely got to 
take off for anything. So when there was a conference on the West Coast, we thought, me and my brothers thought, oh, that's awesome. Uh, let's go. We'll take our snowboards. And while we're there, we'll hit some mountains. We we're going to go up to Whistler, BC, and then fly home. And I wasn't going with the intention to meet anyone. I was too busy to even think about that. But then I saw Carol. And um, I didn't know that she had seen me earlier, but she can tell her version of the story. She know, she'll remember better, but I think I asked her her name and said, let's stay in touch and just had a brief conversation with her. And then we started talking on the phone and the rest is uh, history, as they say. Um, <laughs> how we met. Uh, I had actually seen him um, because even though we live far away, um, we kind of knew of each other. I had quite a few sisters and he had quite a few brothers. And so obviously, um, you know, through our church and stuff like that, I was very aware of uh, his, him and his family. Uh, so I remember being 16 and I saw him and he had his fireman's jacket on. And yeah, basically I told myself that's the type of man I would want to marry when I was old enough. Um, there's just something about him that uh, really got my attention. And uh, then about... Uh, two or three years later, he was out on a trip with his brothers. Um, I think they're going to some national parks and going snowboarding or something like that. And I um, bumped into him and basically <laughs> he asked me, you know, what my name was. And I basically said, I'm Carol and I do know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he just uh, took it stole my heart right there and we were just you know his conversation um just the simple things that he was asking me and then he asked uh, if we could start writing and if he could get my dad's number so that he could ask his permission to write me and get to know me a little bit more um and so that's how it was back in the uh 98 it was handwritten notes um uh, in the mail <laughs> And a few phone calls, um, you know, he was working so much, but we would try and schedule, you know, a few phone calls a week. Um, but I would always receive a letter in the mail, um, about one or two every week, which was really sweet. He, um, and then, yeah, so we got married about six months later because we just both knew that was, I mean, why wait? We both loved each other very much and... Um, yeah, so that's how we met and, uh, um, he proposed to me actually on the beach that we always go to whenever we go out to Oregon. And, uh, so that's always a special place and in my heart, but, uh, yeah, so that's how we met. How long were you guys together before you decided to have children? When we were engaged, we talked about every single thing. Like, um, we would just almost sit down and make lists and just ask all the questions. Um, and so we both knew we wanted children as soon as possible. Caroline came after two miscarriages. Uh, so she was in the first year and then she, we were blessed with her. And that was uh, amazing. First thought when you saw Carol and Carol saw you. Uh, <laughs> like I said, um, yeah, him standing there in his fireman's jacket. Um, he's the one that's that went through my mind. I just couldn't picture myself with anyone else but him. And uh, yeah, even to this day, I still catch myself looking across the room at him and that same feeling comes over me. And it's pretty cool after 25 years. So yeah, he's just everything. So yeah, that's the first thought that uh, went through my head but we just liked each other right from day one and over the years we began to love each other and we've had such an amazing journey over the last 25 years and she's just been from day one uh a, you know my partner and a friend and and someone i can uh, i enjoy doing stuff with i just enjoy her company so when we the opportunity came to travel and adventure together our whole life was an adventure of working in business was an adventure, raising kids was an adventure. So it was just, it wasn't that big of a change to go on the road and just carry on with the adventure. And people say, you know, how do you, how do you stay married being on the road so long together and traveling in tight quarters? I don't know, it just made the marriage better for me. 
we um, just didn't have any hang-ups about little things you know we enjoyed each other's company and above all the other stuff the most important was our marriage so we wouldn't get upset about small things because that wasn't as important as getting along um, and we thought you know our best friends are going to be each other rather than you know her having and she has her friends and, and all that but I I knew from day one I didn't and I wasn't even like that before marriage so I didn't want to be the guy going off I got to go with my friends and be doing guy stuff and I don't care you do your thing we just never felt that way from day one we always said let's just take our interests and meld them together so that we can have a vibrant and fun marriage and so that was something we did from day one and we've done it all along and people will give you advice because I'm not a marriage counselor by any means. Um, all I can tell you, just like parenting is what we did. And it might be right, might be wrong. I don't know. I guess the proof is in the end result and in the pudding. But I've heard people counsel exactly the opposite of what has worked for us. So do what works for you. Some people said, well, me having my friends and her having her friends is the most important thing. And that's what keeps it together. And she has her interests and I have my interests and her hobbies and my hobbies and her money and her and my money and they have almost everything separate and somehow that's what keeps the marriage together um we're exactly the opposite and that's what keeps us happy and and uh makes us feel like we're one you know so i don't know what would work for you but you asked what worked for us and that that's kind of uh what it is have you guys thought about adventuring southeast of the united states let's say florida yeah we 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 love it down there and because that being from Ontario, that is all Ontarians go to Florida every winter. You probably notice that if you're in Florida, in some towns, there's more Canadians than Americans. At least it used to be that way. Um, but uh, it's because we went down every year for vacation. We've been going west now because uh, just exploring different places. But there's so much to see down there and it's such a beautiful part of the world. So, yeah. The second part of this question is how do you make your marriage work while living on the road and remotely? in remote areas um I, I think that lifestyle like i said earlier lends itself to making your marriage work even better why partially because there's fewer distractions partially because you're solving problems together all the time partially because living isn't so easy that you have so much free time to be distracted by other things maybe um but i found it is even easier than when we were in our old life so um try it i think you'll like it how did you meet Carol? I, I, I mentioned that already. What were your early years together like? Um, just an absolute blast. It's been a fun journey. We figured stuff out. We were both raised by our parents, so we learned skills and ways of doing things. But then we came together and said, we're going to take all that training and learning and make our own way. And because times change and things are different, and we developed our own way. And so it was... Uh, it has been super fun and and now we're hard to believe but we're already at the next chapter where the kids are growing up and leaving the nest um one thing i'd say is time flies when you're having fun so it seems like we were just having the kids uh, not that long ago and raising them so um the next chapter being empty nest we we look forward to that with all our hearts it's a super fun chapter and then at some point hopefully uh there's the, the grandparents chapter where the kids, you know, find spouses and have kids. We, we look forward to that chapter too. That's going to be a blast as well. So um, hope that answers your questions. It was um, busy. We had uh, Caroline um, pretty much uh, a year later or about, yeah, a year and a half later. And uh, yeah, it was just really exciting and full of life and new experiences for me, you know, moving to Canada so young and um, yeah, it was just great. Really, really fun. T. Anthony Bland, thanks for your thoughtful question here. And I think that the, the gist of it is um, you're talking about you understand, you know, we had we were together as a young couple, but what has changed as you in the last seven years traveling and as you're an older couple? Um, is there anything you've modified in traveling now to be more comfortable, more active? We're working on the comfortable thing, um, looking for, I think, more space. Uh, often makes more comfort so we're working on that we'll stay tuned because we'll get back to you on that it also allows us to carry things like mountain bikes with more more carry space for the active side of that but our favorite activity is hiking 
First of all, it allows you to get out and see amazing places quietly in nature and um, all you got to carry with you is some good hiking boots and maybe hiking poles if you're if you want and, and a way to carry water. So there's limited gear but uh, maximum uh, activity and fun. And then to what has changed. Um, I was thinking about that and when we first started the kids were young enough that we'd say hey let's go over here or we'd just say we're going here today and there and they'd say okay and they'd go. Then they got older and um, into their teens and then it got a little more complicated. I think we're going over here. Well, we should really go over there, that type of thing. Or we're going to go hike this. No, we should hike there. And it got much more complicated. We made it work. Um, we, we allowed everyone to have their dream bucket list item and then we'd, we'd all go and do that. And we made sure as a family, if someone's into mountain biking but I'm not, well, then you should get into it to the best you can because we we our family were all together in the same boat so to speak so you can't have it where well I don't like mountain biking so I'm not going we just learned to like mountain biking or I like longboarding we all learned to like longboarding or I like hiking and so on um, so we made it work but then now we're at the point where what has changed in the last seven years man we're empty nesters now we're back to the easy traveling um, when Carol and I were going up north, we said, hey, let's stop and hike this trail. We're like, okay, and we do it. We didn't have to consult with anyone. We didn't have to get a consensus from the whole family. It was just super easy. So I'd say the biggest change is how simple things are. We were on the, our first empty nest um, going up to Tuktoyaktuk. Like if we wanted to stop, we would just stop. Where before, you know, traveling with the kids when they were young, it would kind of be like, oh, you know, that type of thing. Or they would be really excited about doing something that maybe I wasn't. Um, but that's all cool because, you know, you just want the kids to be happy. And so you kind of just put some stuff that you want to do on the back burner so that your kids have the most fun. Um, and this time we just felt like we were basically, um, newlyweds or engaged and we were just like going like, Hey, you want to stop for coffee? Sure. Or, you know, you want to stop here and make lunch and just holding hands, being able to talk and, you know, do things like, yeah, it, all over again. It was basically like having, you know, going on another honeymoon together. Um, so that was really fun. And, uh, but each chapter is fun. Like it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't change anything from one to the next, but I am looking forward to spending a lot of quality time with Peter again. Um, and look forward to even the next chapter and I'm sure we'll get super busy in that chapter um, when grandkids start coming um, down the road so I can't wait to just totally be like the best grandmother ever so <laughs> it's, I, I look forward to that but right now this is this chapter and um, so far I'm loving it and uh, can't wait to explore with Pete so the next four questions or so are about church and faith so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but very simply, uh, both Carol and I were raised as Christians. We both actually came from the same church, which is a non-denominational church. We used to actually meet just in our living rooms back in the day as, as a kid growing up. But now it's quite a large uh, church and throughout the world, so it's neat because as we travel, we can uh, keep in touch with people in various parts of the world and throughout North America. Um, someone asked, how do you keep in touch with everyone while you're living remotely and on the road? And um, just the same way we would keep in touch with friends and family, uh, you know, using technology nowadays, but also, like I mentioned earlier, any opportunity we get, we drop in and say hi to people and things like that. But if, you, if attendance is important to you, you can't do both lifestyles. You, you can't really be present there every week while you're also traveling around the world. So... Uh, someone asked how important is your faith to you? Well, faith is very important. We don't talk about it much on our YouTube. In fact, not at all. But hopefully it's evident um, what faith we are. And if not, then we're probably, uh, we have work to do. Um, and then as a family, it just affects everything, our decision making. It is the basis for our value system. And those values are what we act upon. They're like a compass that help guide us. It's, it's very simple how that works. Your decisions, your behaviors, your ways of doing things come out of your beliefs, no matter what your beliefs are. So that's, for us, why faith is so important to us. All right, so that's it for the categorized questions now. There's just a bunch of uh, uncategorized ones, and I'm going to go through them. Some of them are one 
uh, word answer is very quickly answer, but uh, let's get into it. All right, first question. Do you have any stories of any scary encounters you've ever had on the road or even at the cabin, either with animals or people? Yes, there's a couple. <laughs> uh, one, we were in BC and Lando is running ahead like usual and we were just coming around a corner, coming into camp, and all of a sudden he just like rips across the field and he like takes this huge jump and what he jumped on was a big black bear and the bear stood up and like took a big swipe but he thought it was in, like another dog that wanted to play with him and I, we were just screaming i thought it was the end of lando um but luckily the bear he did take a swipe at him and then took off running in the other direction but that was yeah talk about getting your heart pounding that was a very scary moment um another uh time was when we were actually stuck after crossing the avalanche in BC again. Um, we, I woke up to the sound of what I think was a bear and it was like breathing in and out really heavily because I don't know anything that can go that high up. Um, I woke up Pete and I'm like trying to mouth to him like with, and I could hardly even hear my own, like my breathing was pound and my heart was pounding so loud. Like that's all I could hear basically. But uh, you know how you just go into one of those moments like where everything shrinks down and I'm just going through my head of like, I did I clean up everything okay? Like how do we get the kids attention? Um, where, you know, we always sleep with our bear spray on either side of us. Um, and we also have bear spray in the vehicles as well. And we wear it, uh, especially when you're up in, in the bear country. But uh, yeah, that was a scary few minutes. And then it just kind of made a lot of noise, kind of walking around our vehicles and then it left. So that really did get my heart pounding. And it really made me more aware of when we are in those types of areas to be like, um, very bear aware because I'll probably never see it by the time it comes running after me or you know I don't want it to be attracted to our camp because then I'm just putting my kids in danger and myself in danger and um, anyways so yeah that's um, that um, that was one of the scariest things was, was the Lando and when it came into our camp um, people I haven't uh, I don't remember any people like I, I remember once in Texas there was like um, gunfire and it was like right by our camp. Like I mean it was like you could almost hear things like buzzing by and I think they were just being rowdy I hope um, and I thought they would maybe scare um, some people and they did. So um, that was pretty creepy and then a car came and it was just shining in its lights into our camp and we did not know what to do for like a good couple seconds um, until they left um, but we did like hit really low and just sat there but we were in our heads like and Pete was whispering just like you know you have this I have that this is what we're gonna do so we were communicating but we were just being extremely quiet but yeah with uh, animals especially here at the the cabin we're in a wilderness area and so there are bears here once when Pete was quite quite young we were having lunch with um, friends and family in a different part of the island and we uh, Carol needed uh, tomatoes and she said hey Pete can you run down to our cabin and grab a tomato and he said sure and he started walking and came back a minute later or two minutes later with the tomato and he said oh I passed a bear on the way up and we said we hadn't at that point seen one here before we said are you sure are you sure it wasn't a raccoon he's like no I think it was a bear he was pretty young and then sure enough a minute later we saw a bear swimming across the channel so he had actually by himself in the forest walked past a bear so as parents and he was just a toddler as parents we uh became a little more bear aware after that i'm glad it all turned out good and then later when the boys were older they were they do their walk around the island and they walk by uh, they were walking and they heard a noise and then a bear stood up and it was a, a mama bear with cubs and Thankfully, they weren't between the two, and they hightailed it back to the cabin. Um, so we've run into bears on the road and at the cabin. Most of the time, though, it's not a scary incident because black bears uh, in general in the wild are very shy, and they, they don't want to bother you. They just run away. It's where bears are near populations, and they get used to rummaging through trash and things like that, that they start to interfere with people. Not so much out here. 
Um, in terms of people, scary stuff, in general, in the wilderness, no. People say, what if you run into some random crazy person out there? But it, I think those crazy people that are meaning to do harm or meaning to rob someone or meaning to cause trouble tend to go where there are lots of people to be able to do that to. In the wilderness, it's one in a thousand chance you're going to bump into a, some people camping way in the backwoods. So it's not a very good place to go looking for making trouble. So you don't find, uh, we've never run into people out there. And then lastly, when we were in Haiti, um, which was one of the most incredible experiences of our lives, we enjoyed the entire experience. It was life changing for us. But we did have uh, about 20 minutes of fear. <laughs> and it was because we didn't know what was going on. But we, we were awakened at like three o'clock in the morning to the sound of machetes hitting the the gate in the, the area that we were staying and like hundreds of thousands of people actually starting to work their way into the street and there was no electricity so there's no street light so it's pitch black and all you can see were big shapes of people moving and they're all chanting and, and it sounded like they're yelling and making these loud noises and then bonfires started lighting up in the streets and we thought there was a riot happening it sounded to our ears as what you would see on a movie when they're breaching the fence and they're coming in and they're going to attack the building um so that was a very scary moment for us we had the kids were quite young and we really thought we were in trouble there but thankfully um someone was able to make a phone call out of haiti through the dominican republic and find found out that what was actually happening is that they had had an election but the person elected out had refused to leave for a couple of weeks but that night they the person had the person had finally agreed to leave and let the new government take it come in and so there was a massive celebration so what we thought was a riot actually was a celebration and we were in no danger whatsoever but it was a scary moment good question i'm leaving home in my jeep in early september with my wife what are a couple of items i wouldn't think of bringing that you recommend traveling with um here's three things that when we're talking to new travelers they often forget one uh, water filtration make sure you have a good uh, piece of equipment for filtering water uh, another one would be some kind of satellite communicator, especially if you're traveling off-grid um, so that you can contact someone uh, even just to let them know where you are, but also in case of an emergency. And I would recommend a, a global rescue account, depending on where you're going, of course. And then the last one would be a good first aid kit and the ability to use it, know where everything is. Um, those are th three things that a lot of people don't travel with that we think you should have just for the safety factor. All the, the other stuff, um, we have a video that talks about a lot of the gear that we travel with. So I'll put a link to that below. So many serious questions. What I want to know is Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? Love from Vegas. Thanks uh, for lightening it up a bit. Uh, for me, it would be Lord of the Rings. I don't watch a lot of movies. Um, so believe it or not, I've only dabbled into Star Wars a little bit here and there as the kids are watching it. But Lord of the Rings, the kids used to be to so into it on our early travels. I heard it playing behind me as we're going down the road. So I, I could, I knew it off by heart, um, the soundtrack, but I, I never saw the movie. And this winter, believe it or not, because we had some time when it got dark really early, I had promised the kids for years that I was going to watch the whole series with them. And I finally was able to check that off the list. So. Thanks for asking that fun question. Here's an easy one. Being from Medford, Oregon, I'm curious what town Carol's from. She w grew up not in a town, in the kind of in the rural area outside of uh, Salem, Oregon. You have a cabin on the lake in Canada. Have you ever thought about getting a southern base, perhaps in the southern U.S.? If so, where? That's an awesome question, and the answer is yes. Um, almost every Canadian at some point needs a southern base to escape the cold winters. Um, and most of the people from this side of the country go to Florida down there in the winter. And most from the western part of Canada go down to Arizona. And we just fell in love with Arizona over the years. And we, we have been looking around there. You know, we think someday a nice little piece of property in Arizona would be wonderful winter escape for us. You mentioned in one of your vlogs that you went to New Zealand and lived there for a bit. Which part of New Zealand did you live? My husband lives in the Bay of Plenty. Uh, we didn't actually live there, but we did travel around New Zealand for almost six months and we shipped our Jeep over there. So we covered a lot. We covered almost all of the North and the South Island. So um, we like to say we were everywhere in New Zealand, pretty much um, every region for sure. And, and 
yeah, we covered the whole place. The Bay of Plenty area is beautiful, so if you guys live there, uh, lucky you, that's a gorgeous place. And New Zealand is one of those countries we'd go back to in a flash. Your top three best campsites ever. Wow, that's hard to um, answer anything about favorite places and best camp spots, but some definitely do stand out. But often it's not because of the scenery or the place, but because of the memories you had there. But I'll try my best. So one would definitely be in New Zealand uh, at the base of Mount Cook. Or it's, a, it's a national park, so it isn't completely dispersed camping, but it was wild. And we had a massive hike up Mount Olivier. Basically, we could walk from the campground. So because of the views, because of the hike, up to the top of that mountain and because of the, the whole situation that definitely is right up there um, other camp spots anywhere in the desert in the winter we just love those camp spots um, I just off the top of my head uh, when we were down in Big Bend in Texas Big Bend National Park they have this remote camping and some of those spots it's so different from everything else there's no trees you're just in the middle of the desert but it was so remote and so wild I for me personally I really enjoyed that um, and then anything in northern BC for me. Um, on the way to the little town of Atland, so you have to actually go out of BC into Yukon and then come back into BC, there's some spots along the road to Atland that are just epic. Beautiful crystal clear lakes, mountains everywhere. So those would be my three. So this next question is about bears and how backpackers take certain precautions that overlanders don't seem to take as they cook food right with it right near to their sleeping areas and so on. And that is true. Um, it, it, it appears that um, a lot of overlanders have a false sense of security because you're in a tent off the ground or you're in a vehicle. Um, as we all know, bears, if they want to get in, they pretty much can get into any vehicle. You are slightly more protected than just in a ground tent like a backpacker would be. Um, so we highly recommend you take all bear precautions. There's always a risk when in bear country, but the way you mitigate that is by sealing your food in bear-proof containers. Um, we have bear-proof bags and aloe boxes that are bear-proof and coolers that are registered bear-proof. So we try to take all those precautions. There was uh, one time we were in bear country in Montana and I just got into the routine of just everyday camping and didn't think about where we were. And um, I started cooking a meal and then it was actually one of the kids that was like, mom, are you sure you should be doing that like here? And that's when it hit me. Um, and we quickly, you know, shut down camp. And I think we just ate a backpack meal there. But I was like, how do I get the smell out of the air? Crazy thing is, is that we were um, doing a video practicing with the bear containers. Definitely recommend everyone to do that. Cause I just thought, oh yeah, you know, you buy a, a bear canister and you're like, yeah, okay, yeah, pull back and I spray. And all of a sudden, like we were like, you know, taking pictures and, and doing that. We heard the biggest roar ever, like right behind us. And we all just spun around because we weren't even prepared. Like if a bear had come into camp and we all would have been, you know, sitting there, sitting ducks basically. So um, that was a big wake up call for all of us. And even with say my, our son with type one diabetes, he always needs to have a supply of like say um, some sugar or some a little bit of food by his bed and we actually have it in a bear proof um, scent proof bag now ever since that incident because even though yes he is up high on a rooftop tent it won't stop a bear they, they can you know reach in and get whatever that they want you know once they put their mind to it also just reading books and there's a quite a few good YouTube videos that I started watching and I you know the, the boys were planning a trip out to BC just like a, a month ago um, that they were going to go on before Worsley broke down. And I had them sit down and even though they were rolling their eyes and stuff and watch those videos because it, it, it's something you have to really take seriously. Um, so yeah, definitely thank you for that. And um, I'm still learning, but I definitely need to be more bear aware. I've always wondered why you park the Jeeps on a rock. Is it to level? once you're ready to set up camp. Yeah, you're right, it is to level the Jeep because we're sleeping either in a tent or on a sleeping platform in the Jeep. The more level you can get the Jeep, the better sleep you have. So that's why we do it. Yes, you could carry um, levelers like you do in a motor home, but we just thought to save space, we wouldn't use anything like that. We'd just find a rock. Typically, no matter where we go, 
you either find a rock to bring a wheel up or if we're on a sandy area or a beach we can dig under and drive into it to bring a wheel down to level our vehicle so here's a, a good question and unfortunately it's one we haven't solved yet either but we're still looking into it i will be wanting to get some communication device to go between our pickup camper and my on off road bike in the near future i find all sorts of info for bike to bike or rig to rig communications but nothing for bike to rig have you found anything that works between the rigs and the boys bikes and currently we don't have a good solution they do carry so we use midland gmrs radios in the vehicles and that's great for rig to rig they use a cardo system between the bikes and that's awesome and what we've done is give them one of our midland handhelds and so they you know when they pull over and stop they can communicate with us but um they are working on something and that's a question i hope to be able to answer uh in the near future but it's something to do with the garmin when they get a certain garmin it will allow communication to the jeep but uh stay tuned for more information on that all right this question is can you recommend some of your favorite outdoorsy adventure books um yeah for sure so anything by levison wood is uh, going to be great he's an adventurer from britain and uh we followed him for years and just love all all his material um since the kids were young we've been reading and rereading and listening to the audiobook of uh the shackleton adventure it's called endurance um that one's just an incredible amazing story um one man's wilderness by dick prenicky is really cool especially for cabin life it's one that helped us get uh, the inspiration to spend a winter here at the cabin. Right now I'm reading the book by our friend Dan Greck from The Road Chose Me, and the book's called The Road Chose Me, which talks about his journey down the Pan American Highway, so that uh, gives us lots of good information for our upcoming journeys. So hopefully that helps. This next question is, do you ever suffer from decision fatigue? <laughs> Man, we've been feeling that uh, lately. So many decisions uh, to be made in a short amount of time. But, um, yeah, a little bit sometimes, but I uh, also grew up in business where you have to just make a call in order to keep the business going. And so I've learned to be able to do that. And uh, sometimes when you put the research and thought into all the op options, an option just presents itself, like what happened with the engine with Worsley. So, um, but that's a great question. This one is, uh, what keeps you going? What keeps you from burnout of being on the road so much? Yeah, well, we've always had the um, luxury of having this cabin from day one. So we'd go on a six month journey and then we'd come back and put our feet down for a little bit. Um, the longest we've been without coming to the cabin was uh, two years, just the last couple of years with all the border issues and so on. So that was uh, a long time being away. And you can watch some of our videos, how we felt when we came back. And it was just such a, an awesome feeling. So having the cabin has been a huge help and being able to get off the road sometimes, put your feet down. My dad always said uh, a change is as good as a rest. And so that I think has been a big help for us. What are your top three non-negotiables for any long trip besides the basics like first aid or tools? Things that are not typical. Um, I'm, I'm assuming when you say long trip, this is somewhere remote because uh, like our trip to Northern Quebec or up the trans Tiaga or up to the Arctic Ocean. Um, Non-negotiable is one communication device for satellite. Uh, we use Zolio for that because um, you just don't want to be stuck in a remote area and have no way of communicating. So that's, that's top, top of the line. Um, we would put with that um, some kind of medical evac, like we use um, Global Rescue, in case, depending on if you're traveling alone or with the family. But in any case, I think it's a, it's a good thing to have. So there's that, and then um, water filtration and spare fuel. Now you could carry jerry cans, but we have Long Range America fuel tanks, and those have been a game changer for us and just given us the confidence to get out on these extremely long trips without having to work. You still got to manage fuel, but you don't have to worry about it. Um, you can drive the way you normally would, always knowing that you have a refill underneath your vehicle. So we'll go with those three. What goes into planning an extended trip? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, depends if you're going abroad or on your own continent, but um, most of the planning is done in the building stage of your vehicle. So if you have a dialed in vehicle, um, you know you have all the essentials on that vehicle so there's 
really all you have to do at that point is plan your route. Um, if you have food storage, you just got to make sure there's food and fuel along the, the path that you're going. If it's overseas, like you're going to go through the whole process of shipping a vehicle like we did to New Zealand, there's a lot more planning there, um, getting prices on shipping and insurance and, um, you know, travel, medical emergency insurance, and then determining how much time you have and how long it takes to get to the places you want to go. And all that is the navigation stuff, you know, what places are a must see, what places are a nice to see. Um, we didn't do too much planning on that though. Caroline had a ton of places she wanted to see. And then when we got there, we did more of the navigation day by day. I think today's a beautiful day and we're in a beautiful place. Let's stay an extra day. We're flexible that way. Some people have an itinerary and they have places booked and hard dates all throughout. And that's one way to travel and it works for some people. For us, we're, it wouldn't work for us because we just like to go more by the seat of, seat of our pants and go by how we're feeling at the time, what the weather's doing, what we think about a place. There's a hike we just heard about from a local. We're going to stay here an extra couple of days. We like having that flexibility and freedom. So don't over plan, but make sure you have the essentials. How do you do laundry when it was your whole family, Lando, in the Jeeps? So when you're up kind of more in remote places, like in what we just did in Quebec or say going up to Tuktoyaktuk, a lot of gas stations will have a laundry mat and a shower like um, together. So it's like $5 for the shower and probably $10 for, you know, $5 for a wash, ten uh, $5 for um, dryer. So that's really convenient. And I didn't know that kind of the first few years. And then I started finding that out. And so that I didn't have to go all the way into a town, like a big town and find a laundry mat um, that a lot of these more remote places will. And you can kind of ask them because sometimes it's like you would never even think it, but you ask them and they say, oh yeah, we do. We have a shower and laundry over here. And um, so that's really convenient. And I actually like doing my laundry in the smaller places instead of the big places. It just, it just feels cleaner to me. Um, or if we're, again, like say the, uh, even, you know, the boy socks and just like t-shirts, uh, underwear, stuff like that. If we're way out in the country and no one wants to go back into town just for laundry and stuff, we have enough food, we have enough supplies. Um, I just boil water and I have these two totes just for laundry and I have like a bamboo scrubber from like what you would see in the olden days, but um, it works fantastic. And I found like this really cool um, organic soap bar that works better than laundry detergent that Anyways, for me. And then I just hang it up between some trees or I hang it up in the door windows and, you know, shut the door and it just hangs, it hangs dries that way. So that way everyone's kind of feeling fresh and um, not so grimy and it lets you stay out a lot longer. When overlanding, what's the longest you've been off grid before needing to check back in for groceries? Um, well, definitely a lot longer when it's just Carol and I, we could stay several weeks. Um, for sure when it's the five of us we, we'd probably you know two weeks was pushing it um we've got to the point where we were down to our last meals we knew the next day we were going to be passing uh civilization and getting groceries and so on yeah so it's a, it's a couple of weeks depending on on how many people you have and we could go much longer depending on how rough you know basically it comes down to food and water and fuel so um, if you're not doing a lot of driving, and we tend to be moving a lot, we don't stay in one place that long. But if you're staying in one place and you have lots of fuel, all it comes down to then is uh, food and water. And typically where we camp, there's often a fresh water source and we, have, we can filter, so that's unlimited water. Then it just comes down to food. But then we always have an emergency supply of food as well. So um, we go back to civilization because we're running out of the food stuffs that we want to have. Um, more than because we have to. So we could foreseeably stay in the wilderness with our vehicles for um, quite an extended period of time with with all the fuel. We Our heating comes off the fuel as well. So with the two tanks, we could easily stay out there for a month or more. Um, with the solar charging up our batteries and everything, we have power, we have food, we have extended fuel. Um, and the ability to filter water unlimited. So 
um, yeah, the, these are uh, bug out vehicles and they allow us to do that. It really depends where you are and what kind of overlanding you're doing at the time. I would have to say probably two weeks um, because we travel so fast. Like our kids are very active. <laughs> um, they like to see things, explore things. So like, you know, for them to sit um, even for like, say, after two days, maybe three, they start getting kind of antsy because they are like, but over there, that looks really, really cool. And let's just drive just a little bit further to go see that spot. So they're always out there um, exploring um, and wanting to kind of move a bit faster. Um, so I think moving forward, I talk, you know, I've been talking a lot with Pete and um, we do want to start staying maybe a little bit longer, but not too long, but just longer. I think it'd be kind of cool. I'm from north, northern Minnesota, northwest of Duluth. I want to take my first trip into Canada next year and take four to six weeks. Any suggestions on what part to start in and visit? Man, that's cool. Um, you're going to love it. Uh, there's some really neat country to go through in Canada. So if you're in Duluth on that side of Lake Superior, I would just head north. You could cross into Canada somewhere in the prairies and, and then go west. Take the Trans-Canada out to Alberta. If you've never seen any part of Canada, get into Alberta and drive the Columbia Icefields Parkway. Um, it's spectacular. If you've never been there, mountains in all directions, glaciers and wildlife that'll come down on the road. It's all paved, um, but it's it's a must-do. In July, June and July, maybe the first part of August, I would try to avoid it because it can get busy. It's it's There's a lot of tourists that come to see the, the magnificent scenery. But man, off season, if you're able to do it, you have the place pretty much to yourself. And it is one of the most epic drives in the world. Out of all the places you've traveled, what's your very favorite and why? Um, I, I sort of answered that in terms of the camp spots, but uh, that's a very hard one to answer, as we've said many times, because every place is unique. And it really comes down to even, you know, scenery can be, wow, I love going there because of the scenery, but also it could be a great experience you had or people you met or cultural things and food and all that. So it's it's almost impossible to pin down my favorite, but I, I will do that anyway, just because of the circumstances and the beauty of the place and the people and the culture and all these things combined. Our trip to New Zealand was one of my favorites. Uh, another reason that made it so special is I just come off of, um, you know, my whole career of working very hard and, and every day and hardly taking a break. And then to go from that into six months where I could just wear flip flops every day and I could grow out a beard. And, um, that was just magical. And I had no worries and we're the other side of the world. So nobody bothered me or contacted me. We had sold the business about a year before, but we went through, a, there's a transition period where I got to be on call and answer questions to the new uh, people that were taking over the day-to-day -day operation. So we did that while we traveled around, but that period had ended and then we went down under and it was just absolute bliss for six months. So for all those reasons, that was, that, that'd be hard to ever beat. Um, this question is about here at the island. How close are our neighbors on your island? I, me and my brothers and dad own this whole property. It's 10 acres. Um, we don't have anyone living full time anywhere on the lake. There is at the marina, and that's um, I don't know how many kilometers or miles away, but it's like a five minute boat ride from here. But we do have other cabins on the lake that are owned by my brothers and and uh, their families, and they come up once or twice in the winter and a few more times than that in the summer. In fact, a lot of them are here this weekend, and that's the boats you might hear going by from time to time. Um, but every cabin is within walking distance, so they're. They're private enough that if you don't want to see anyone, you have your privacy, but they're close enough that we can get together and hang out with each other and then walk home at night. So um, it's the perfect situation. Are there any cabins near you for sale? My father's from Ontario. My wife and I have always dreamed of having a place on the lake. We need a place for the summer to get out of the Texas heat. Yeah, must be hot down there right now. Um, there aren't any places for sale right here on this lake that I know of and they rarely come up for sale. They, they often are sold within families before they ever hit the market. But 
yeah, if you're serious about it, there are real just Google real estate agents in Ontario cottage country. And um, often if you build a relationship with a real estate agent, they can make you aware of properties either just before they come on the market or when they're new to the market. And then you'll have a chance. With all the years of travel, your equipment has changed over time. What have you left at home and what is on the wish list? Um, hmm. That's probably the uh, to get a full answer on that you'd have to go back and look at our earlier equipment videos versus what we have now but we've we still have all the equipment we had at the beginning but you know in our current configurations we don't have slide out fridges and stoves some of that's moved to the trailer um, but and also we've learned how to travel much lighter than back in the day um, so we did some of our last couple of trips with you know, a little uh, jet boil stove and a cooler versus a built-in stove and a fridge. But those are, you know, month-long trips versus living full-time. So it really depends on your your type of travel and your configuration. We've gone from rooftop tents to living inside now with the, with the JXLs on the Jeep. So that's been a big change. The only thing on our wish list, nothing in terms of camping gear really, um, just for Carol and I, as we do more empty nest uh, travel and more international stuff, we're looking towards uh, a truck type setup. And we'll have more to share about that later. I came across your channel via your sister, Carol's sister, Beth, and their channel's called um, Crowley House Flower Farm. They, you've seen us visit them whenever we're in Oregon. They have a beautiful flower farm, just a gorgeous place to visit. And it's set in the section of Oregon where there's wineries and all that. It's just a beautiful place and it's a lot of fun. Check out their channel. We'll put a link below. But this question is, are there any other family members on either Pete or Carol's side that do YouTube? No, uh, not that I know of, except Dan. Check out his channel at Dan Van Straitland. Are you seeing a decline in the availability of dispersed campsites? Hmm. No, we haven't noticed. Um, I don't know as if that's a problem or not. So far, so good. Um, when we travel in northern northern parts of Canada, we haven't noticed any problem. And sometimes we're creating our own camp spots. There's so much wilderness that uh, you could just go ahead and create your own spots. Um, in the States, when we're traveling through the desert, they seemed plenty full. But we do tend to go to very remote areas. So thankfully, we haven't, and I hope we never do. My wife and I will retire soon. What overland adventures would you recommend? Well, congratulations on retiring both of you soon um, and getting into overland adventures. Which ones would we recommend? Um, there's so many amazing places. I don't know what country you're in or where you're from, but if you're in North America, one that we highly recommend is doing that entire journey all the way up to Tuktoyaktuk -tuk in Northwest Territories. It is, especially if you do it in like we did in late August, um, before it gets too cold and right at the time when all the muskeg and the plants are all turning colors and it's just gorgeous. It's a very remote trip. You're not going to see a ton of people on the way. You have to have good tires and, and reliable vehicle. But And it's a very, very long journey, but you'll be going through some spectacular country. And when you end up at the end there, you can take a dip in the Arctic Ocean. And the people there, the Innu people that live in that tiny village, they only started, the road only went in like three years ago or something. So before that, they had no connection with the outside world. So they're very, very uh, welcoming and wonderful people. And it's such a neat cult cultural experience. It's like stepping back in time. So I put that at the top of your list. When you first started out, where did you find or learn where you can drive and go and see? Is there a map? That's a good question. We had no clue when we first started out, but as we... So we stuck to major sites. Our, our initial experience and our initial adventure was really to hit national parks. So it wasn't that hard. You could punch it into your Apple Maps and you'd end up at a national park. So we did that for a while. But then as we started to get more adventurous and want to do backcountry stuff, we had to rely on other people, friends that had done it, try to get locations. And, um, and then people introduced us somewhere along the way to iOverlander. And that's a really good resource for you. Um, tons of camp spots. You just go to the area you're in and you'll find a spot. And often that's just the first one. That'll lead you to another one and another one. 
So not every spot is marked. It's just random. It's all volunteer. But somebody might have said, hey, I found a really good spot. And they say what it was like. There was cell coverage there or no cell coverage. And there was room for a big rig or no, only room for a small rig. Um, it was near a river. All the information is usually in there. So that gets you to the spot. And often it'll be down a logging road somewhere. And then you realize, hey, if I carry on down that road, I find another one and another one that weren't marked. And so that's how you start exploring. So get I Overlander. Before I Overlander uh, for us, we just kind of stuck to national parks um, and just your typical, you know, big sign type thing. But then we started noticing like these Jeeps and trucks and they would pull off on a road, a dirt road, and they would just start hauling, you know, and um, they would have their tents and everything. And we're like, that's what we want to do. Like, you know, because like that's adventure, that looks fun. So we um started just slowly just kind of going out there you know and asking in in towns and saying hey where's a good camp part where's a good trail and everyone wants you to have a good time so they're like hey here and here and here so asking the locals is like the best tip ever like it, it beats even any app um but so we would find all these places and we're like i can't believe we drove past this place going to you know moab a hundred times and never knew this little gym was out here and it's not crowded, there's no people. And so definitely um, my best uh, tip would be ask the local and then get the iOverlander map, um, app. And um, I know there's quite a few other ones, but those are the ones that I always use. Um, but I'm sure some of you could even tell us a few more. So if you do know more apps, let us know. So I want to thank you guys for all your questions and my goodness, did your guys' questions really got our wheels turning. Um, we would stay up so late the last couple of nights just talking and talking and planning and rethinking all different ideas and trips and now you guys really helped get us um, clarity on a lot of that. So thanks again. Um, I love having you guys with us and really enjoyed spending time sitting down reading all of your notes and questions um i would i didn't question i didn't answer all of them but i think pete did a pretty good job and i hope you guys have a wonderful sunday and have a good weekend